Under mounting pressure, the Stormont government gave way on welfare relief payments. But Prime Minister James Craig had little to offer by way of economic remedy. I would like to say that any observer of world conditions must realize that there is an unsettlement prevalent in many countries due doubtless to the uh, state of uh, finance, of trade and of industry. But whatever it may be, there is no doubt that from time to time people are apt to do certain things to take action which in normal peaceful times they would never dream of. And it will be a sad day if ever any country, if any country suffers from a mischievous action of any single individual or any body of individuals. Working class unity was a clear threat to unionist authority and Craig appealed to traditional loyalties to bring Protestant workers back into line. We are part of Great Britain. I think I am right in saying we are the most loyal part of Great Britain. And all Ulster men rejoice in the close relationship between the mother country and ourselves. In 1935, Protestant Ulster was in mourning. Edward, Lord Carson, the man who had threatened violence when Irish independence seemed likely to win favor at Westminster, was dead. Protestant Unionists turned out in their thousands as his body was returned to Belfast for burial. Although remote from Ulster politics for 15 years, Carson was still a hero. But their presence on the streets as his body was borne on a gun carriage was more than just respect for a past hero, an old leader. His honored grave in St. Anne's Cathedral was a symbol, a strengthening of the resolve, a way to show Southern politicians that the border was there to stay. Within two years, Protestant spirits were to be lifted. The coronation of King George VI prompted a royal visit. Amid tight security, the Republican menace was still widespread. Their Majesties disembarked to a tumultuous welcome. In spite of poverty, unemployment, and poor living conditions, the well-scrubbed Protestant working people turned out in their thousands to cheer. Under the blue skies of a British Ulster, Protestants were anxious to demonstrate their gratitude for what were in truth the economic scraps from Britain's table. At Belfast City Hall, seat of the first Northern Ireland Parliament, the comfortable middle classes and the unionist politicians seemed anxious to demonstrate that all was well within loyal Ulster. Once again, the Catholic population decided to stay away. Ex-servicemen were honored. A reminder, if reminder was necessary, of the sacrifice of Ulstermen in the service of the Crown at the World War I battles of Passchendaele, Ypres, and particularly the Somme. It was a message not lost on the royal party or the British government which directed proceedings. His Majesty laid a wreath at the Cenotaph honoring all those who had died, Protestant and Catholic. The King was cheered to the echo Meanwhile, south of the border, the ruling Fianna Fáil party, founded by Emin de Valera, was moving towards full independence. In 1937, he produced a new constitution, claiming sovereignty over the whole island, including Northern Ireland. De Valera moved the recovery of the lost territory to the top of the agenda. The 1921 treaty, signed in London, had kept the Irish Free State within the British Empire. Bitterly opposed by de Valera at the time, he now attempted to persuade the British to leave Ireland and to allow both parts to move back together. But with war in Europe looming, Britain was anxious to maintain its strategic foothold in Northern Ireland. So de Valera returned home empty-handed, his dream not realized. 
Ireland united, Ireland free, Ireland self-supporting and self-reliant, Ireland speaking her own tongue and through it giving to the world our ancient treasures of Christian Gaelic culture. These are the ideals to which enthusiastic young Ireland is now devoting energy. The new constitution, with its claim of sovereignty over Northern Ireland, and the prospect of the South withdrawing from the empire, spread shockwaves among Unionists in the North. Ulster would have no truck with such political parleys. And in order to demonstrate her determination to resist any weakening of Britain's resolve on the Union, an election was called. The border was to be the sole issue. Unionist candidates called for a fresh declaration of Northern Ireland's determination to remain part of the United Kingdom. And English cinema goers retreated to a somewhat quaint demonstration of Ulster politics in action. Republic, is it? Let them try and get Ulster into the Republic if they want to fight in their hands. Ulster's royal to the king, God bless him. The outcome was inevitable, and a larger than usual Unionist majority was returned. A source of considerable satisfaction for the Unionist leadership. In spite of outright Unionist rejection, the end to partition remained the dominant issue in Irish political life. This program aims at restoring the unity of this island and creating an independent Ireland living its own cultural, economic, and national life. We do not wish to seek quarrels with any country. We wish well to our neighbor, Great Britain, as to all other countries. We want our liberty so that our cooperation with Great Britain may be one of harmony and friendship. Harmony and friendship was far from apparent as the decade ended and Europe prepared for war.